Borman introduced the crew, followed by each man giving his impression of the lunar surface and what it was like to be orbiting the moon. Borman described it as being, a vast, lonely, forbidding expanse of nothing. After talking about what they were flying over, Anders said that the crew had a message for all those on Earth. Borman finished the broadcast by wishing a Merry Christmas to everyone on Earth. Borman said, and from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas and God bless all of you all of you on the good Earth. The only task left for the crew at this point was to perform the trans-Earth injection, which was scheduled for two and a half hours after the end of the television transmission. The Tay was the most critical burn of the flight, as any failure of the SPS to ignite would strand the crew in lunar orbit, with little hope of escape. As with the previous burn, the crew had to perform the maneuver above the far side of the moon, out of contact with Earth. The spacecraft telemetry was reacquired as it re-emerged from behind the moon at 89 hours, 28 minutes, and 39 seconds, the exact time calculated. When voice contact was regained, Lovell announced, please be informed, there is a Santa Claus, to which Ken Mattingly, the current Capcom, replied, that's affirmative, you are the best ones to know. The spacecraft began its journey back to Earth on December 25th, Christmas Day. Once the crew realized why the computer had changed the module's attitude, they realized that they would have to re-enter data to tell the computer the module's actual orientation. The cruise back to Earth was mostly a time for the crew to relax and monitor the spacecraft. As long as the trajectory specialists had calculated everything correctly, the spacecraft would re-enter Earth's atmosphere two and a half days after Tay and splash down in the Pacific. On Christmas afternoon, the crew made their fifth television broadcast. This time, they gave a tour of the spacecraft, showing how an astronaut lived in space. Another Slayton surprise was a gift of three miniature bottles of brandy, which Borman ordered the crew to leave alone until after they landed. There were also small presents to the crew from their wives. After two uneventful days, the crew prepared for re-entry. The computer would control the re-entry, and all the crew had to do was put the spacecraft in the correct attitude, with a blunt end forward. In the event of computer failure, Borman was ready to take over. Six minutes before they hit the top of the atmosphere, the crew saw the moon rising above the Earth's horizon, just as had been calculated by the trajectory specialists. As the module hit the thin outer atmosphere, the crew noticed that it was becoming hazy outside as glowing plasma formed around the spacecraft. The spacecraft started slowing down, and the deceleration peaked at six standard gravities. With the computer controlling the descent by changing the attitude of the spacecraft, Apollo 8 rose briefly like a skipping stone before descending to the ocean. At 30,000 feet, the Drogue parachute deployed, stabilizing the spacecraft, followed at 10,000 feet by the three main parachutes. The spacecraft splashdown position was officially reported as 8 degrees 8 and 165 degrees 1 foot W in the North Pacific Ocean, southwest of Hawaii at 15 hours 51 minutes and 42 seconds Coordinated Universal Time on December 27, 1968. When the spacecraft hit the water, the parachutes dragged it over and left it upside down, in what was termed stable two position. As they were buffeted by a 10-foot swell, Borman was sick, waiting for the three flotation balloons to right the spacecraft. 45 minutes later, the crew was safe on the flight deck of the Yorktown. Apollo 8 came at the end of 1968, a year that had seen much upheaval in the United States and most of the world. Even though the year saw political assassinations, political unrest in the streets of Europe and America, and the Prague Spring, Time magazine chose the crew of Apollo 8 as its Men of the Year for 1968, recognizing them as the people who most influenced events in the preceding year. They had been the first people ever to leave the gravitational influence of the Earth and orbit another celestial body. They had survived a mission that even the crew themselves had rated as having only a 50-50 chance of fully succeeding. The effect of Apollo 8 was summed up in a telegram from a stranger, received by Borman after the mission, that stated simply, Thank you Apollo 8. You saved 1968. One of the most famous aspects of the flight was the Earthrise picture that the crew took as they came around for their fourth orbit of the moon. This was the first time that humans had taken such a picture while actually behind the camera, and it has been credited as one of the inspirations of the first Earth Day in 1970. It was selected as the first of Life magazine's 100 photographs that changed the world. Apollo 11 astronaut Michael Collins said, "Eight's a momentous historic significance was foremost, while space historian Robert K. Poole saw Apollo 8 as the most historically significant of all the Apollo missions. The mission was the most widely covered by the media since the first American orbital flight, Mercury Atlas 6 by John Glenn, in 1962. There were 1,200 journalists covering the mission, 
with the BBC's coverage broadcast in 54 countries in 15 different languages. The Soviet newspaper Pravda featured a quote from Boris Nikolaevich Petrov, chairman of the Soviet Intercosmos program, who described the flight as an outstanding achievement of American space sciences and technology. It is estimated that a quarter of the people alive at the time saw either live or delayed the Christmas Eve transmission during the ninth orbit of the Moon. The Apollo 8 broadcasts won an Emmy Award, the highest honor given by the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences. Madeleine Murray O'Hare, an atheist, later caused controversy by bringing a lawsuit against NASA over the reading from Genesis. O'Hare wanted the courts to ban American astronauts who were all government employees from public prayer in space. Though the case was rejected by the Supreme Court of the United States, apparently for lack of jurisdiction in outer space, it caused NASA to be skittish about the issue of religion throughout the rest of the Apollo program. Buzz Aldrin, on Apollo 11, self-communicated Presbyterian communion on the surface of the moon after landing. He refrained from mentioning this publicly for several years and referred to it only obliquely at the time. In 1969, the United States Post Office Department issued a postage stamp commemorating the Apollo 8 flight around the moon. The stamp featured a detail of the famous photograph of the Earthrise over the moon taken by Anders on Christmas Eve, and the words, in the beginning God. The first words of the Book of Genesis. In January 1969, just 18 days after the crew's return to Earth, they appeared in the Super Bowl III pregame show, reciting the Pledge of Allegiance, before the national anthem was performed by trumpeter Lloyd Geisler of the Washington National Symphony Orchestra. N4, spacecraft location in January 1970, the spacecraft was delivered to Osaka, Japan, for display in the U.S. Pavilion at Expo, 70. It is now displayed at the Chicago Museum of Science and Industry, along with a collection of personal items from the flight donated by Lovell and the spacesuit worn by Frank Borman. Jim Lovell's Apollo 8 spacesuit is on public display in the Visitor Center at NASA's Glenn Research Center. Bill Anders' spacesuit is on display at the Science Museum in London, United Kingdom. In popular culture Apollo 8's a historic mission has been depicted and referred to in several forms, both documentary and fiction. The various television transmissions and 16mm footage shot by the crew of Apollo 8 were compiled and released by NASA in the 1969 documentary Debrief, Apollo 8, hosted by Burgess Meredith. Spacecraft Films released, in 2003, a three-disc DVD set containing all of NASA's TV and 16mm film footage related to the mission, including all TV transmissions from space, training and launch footage, and motion pictures taken in flight. Other documentaries include, Race to the Moon, as part of Season 18 of American Experience and In the Shadow of the Moon. Apollo's daring mission aired on PBS Nova in December 2018, marking the flight's 50th anniversary. Apollo 8 serves as character development in the 1995 film Apollo 13, in which Jim Lovell is motivated to walk on the moon by his Apollo 8 experience and later disappointed to be so near the surface twice without walking on it. Parts of the mission are dramatized in the 1998 miniseries From the Earth to the Moon episode, 1968. The SIVB stage of Apollo 8 was also portrayed as the location of an alien device in the 1970 UFO episode, Conflict. Apollo 8's a lunar orbit insertion was chronicled with actual recordings in the song, the other side, on the 2015 album The Race for Space, by the band Public Service Broadcasting. In the credits of the animated film Free Birds a newspaper front page about the Apollo 8 mission is doctored to read, as one of the most turbulent, tragic years in American history drew to a close, millions around the world were watching and listening as the Apollo 8 astronauts, Frank Gobbler, Jim Snood, and Bill Waddles, became the first turkeys to orbit another world. A documentary film, First to the Moon, the Journey of Apollo 8 was released in 2018. The choral music piece Earthrise by Luke Byrne commemorates the mission. The piece was premiered on January 19, 2020, by Sydney Philharmonia Choirs at the Sydney Opera House.